welcome everybody. We've got a, a lovely group. My name is Daniel Bernard, and it is an absolute pleasure for me to introduce our speaker and the person who's leading our workshop today, Miss Elizabeth Kofi. She is uh, the Global Leadership and Transformation Committee Honorary Member and London Chapter Member for DLC. Elizabeth founded Spark Leadership in 2005 to advise board executives on leading change in their people and in their organizations. Elizabeth is an internationally recognized consultant, speaker, and author focused on developing CEOs and their successors at board, at the board level of FTSE 100 and Global 500 companies to achieve stretching organization strategies. She has also received numerous awards, which include the 2020 Pioneering Women Leader Award and the 2018 to 2020 Woman Super Achiever Award from the Economic Times. We're extremely excited. I know that I'm excited for her workshop today which gives an overview of how to steer a course around organizational barriers to influence actively in an ethical and systematic way. No time more for me to speak it right over to the main event. Happy to hand over to you, Elizabeth, for this wonderful workshop. Elizabeth, welcome to DLC Workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much for that generous uh, introduction. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here today. This is a course that um, I absolutely love teaching, and I, I teach it about four times a month and have been doing so for about 15 years. So without any further ado, let me let me start. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to say that this is a course I love to teach and people love to be in. Um, and I can be very humble in saying that because I didn't design this course. Uh, the course has been designed by a guy called Dr. Joel DeLuca who uh, studied the topic of strategic influencing for 20 years. Uh, with 11,000 people, um, over nine multinational companies. So um, let's move on. So this, this um, model is a model um, by, it's not by Joel, it's by two um, British academics called Badley and James who came up with this model in 1987. So let's look at the two um, axes. So you have that north-south axis, which is really about levels of awareness of the politics in the organization. On the top, you have high levels of awareness, on the bottom, you have low levels of awareness. And then the east-west axis is on the right side. It's basically about how much integrity you have in your behavior. On the right side, we have people acting with high levels of integrity. So they say what they do and they do what they say. And on the left-hand side, we have low levels of integrity, which Badley and James refer to as psychological game playing. And in this kind of model, Joel used to kind of look at the left-hand side and say, this is the dark side. This is when you start moving into unethical or immoral behaviors. Um, and the, the motivation for the people on the left tends to be about me, me, me. What's good for my career? What's good for my um, status and my wealth? Whereas on the right-hand side, uh, you tend to get people who are interested in the collective. Um, so they might be thinking about the division or they might be thinking about the team or they might be thinking about the company or the country. You look at this model, do you, think, oh, I know somebody who's in one of those boxes. Well, actually, I think I know people in every box, for a start. And I also think mm -hmm. I uh, can identify myself in a couple of, in more than one of those boxes over my career. I think from my point of view, the, the main difference to, that I could always point uh, on is the difference between putting yourself first or putting the organization first. And what kind of behaviors would you see um, in, let's say, the clever foxes? Instead of speaking openly to a forum, they tap up people individually uh, to convince uh, in a wily way of their opinion. It's a good thing for us to kind of debunk to some degree. The people on the top both sides are doing that. One side is doing it ethically and the other side is not. So let's say Sanchi is one of my rivals and I want to make sure that her program doesn't get funded, even if her program is fantastic. There's positive ways of doing it as well. I can go behind the scenes, Daniel, and have a chat with you and say, listen, I think she's She's come up with a real winner here. I think it's going to do this, that, and the other thing for the organization. So both of those kind of conversations have happen, but one is ethical and the other one is not. Rajiv, let me pick up on your, your kind of comments here. In terms of uh, self-identification, I place myself somewhere in the borderline between innocent and wise. Uh, it takes me a bit of time to understand the... Uh, 
different layers of uh, motives you know that people may have so i am a slow slow picker of the political motives in an organization have you kind of strayed over to the left at all any any time in your in your career i don't think so although there have been always temptations of uh, you know giving it back to people the way they are behaving what i'm hearing from from you two is that there's a kind of alignment naturally on the right hand side and indeed i think people who are drawn to this course which is about the ethical version of of uh, strategic influencing are probably going to be that way minded but i'm keen to kind of understand with you a little bit more um, about what goes on on the left hand side so let me ask a question to the group what, how would you distinguish between that kind of clever fox on the top and the inept donkey. And let me just clarify, inept is not a person who's bad at their job, but rather inept at strategic influencing. Well, I think uh, both the characters are there in every organization, I believe. Just the difference is that it, it really takes some skill to understand who's the fox and who's the uh, inept. How would you decide? I mean, what would you be able to see with the donkey, do you think, that you couldn't see with the fox? Uh, I believe there is no wrong in being a fox or the donkey because uh, if a donkey thinks to be a fox, it cannot be. And if a fox tries to be a donkey, it cannot be. So it's basically a personal strategic positioning that you do. From a realistic perspective, I feel uh, it is difficult for organizations even if finding uh, the person. For example, if there are two people, one is not highly ethical, the second person is highly ethical. Okay. So, and if the first person is very productive, giving high results to the organization, and if the second person who is not so effective, but not giving, I mean, as in very ethical, but not giving much of results. So, uh, it is actually a question of uh, uh, commercial viability and integrity at the same time, which one would be uh, on a high, uh, longer tenure uh, asset for you, I believe. I want to um, pick up on this distinction between kind of commercial successfulness versus um, ethics in your strategic influencing, because the course is really about the latter of those two. And the reality is that you can be commercially really good at your job in any one of the four boxes. When people first come into um, jobs uh, after they've done their, their schooling over the course of your career, which make you more alert and more aware to the politics happening. You might start out on the right, but you actually might start out on the left if you grow up in a family situation or other aspects that are influential like maybe your faith, and that's okay. Your moral compass is on the left. One of the things I like to also say, because Daniel talked about how um, foxes tend to hire other foxes or attract other foxes. While that is true, it is also true that foxes like having donkeys and lambs in their teams. They're easy to manipulate. Foxes are always in competition. If you think about, you know, the politics of today, we look around at world leaders um, in this Ukraine-Russian situation, and there is one leader who is saying, things that we all know to be untrue um, and is very good at that. So it's effective at lying. But there are other people who lie, um, but not very effectively. So we can kind of see through it. And those are like the donkeys. So when you think of organization politics, what words and phrases come to mind? Stressful, <laughs> promotion, maneuvering, navigating for success, culture, manipulation, bureaucratic. Interesting kind of combination we get here, some positives, success, some neutral, and some negatives. When Joel asked the 11,000, this is what he heard from them. Backstabbing, brown nosing, boot licking, style over substance, manipulative, hidden agendas, old boy networks, deals under the table, turf struggles, and my personal favorite, testosterone overload. So now we're going to move into a case. Basically, um, this is a case which was a, an actual Fortune 500 case. Joel did not work with this company, but one of his friends did. So the data is real data. And in this, I'm going to play two roles. But my first role is I'm going to pretend to be Alice, your boss, and you are all part of my marketing team. Um, I was hired a year ago by the CEO to first put more emphasis on marketing with you, but also to look to the future of the organization. So together, you and I have put together a, an approach which is called the Chromium Project. And in the case today is Monday afternoon. And on Friday, there's going to be a meeting of me and my four peers 
to decide upon budget for three potential projects. And Chromium is one of those. So I've been in the company only a year, but you've been there for many, many years. So you know all the ins and outs of the company and who likes whom and all of that stuff. So I'm going to actually ask you to think about what strategic influencing should happen between the Monday today and Friday when that those decisions are going to be taken. Let me tell you a little bit about the other two projects. So one of the projects is being led by uh, Bill Stanton. He's the head of R&D and New Technology. This is, while it's a nice project, it's not actually essential. And we could defer it for three years without any negative impact. The third project is a manufacturing plant. And basically the head of manufacturing, Tom Ansel, and he really wants to leave a fresh new manufacturing plant. And he's been trying for the last two years to get the capital to be able to do that. So those are the three projects that we're going to be kind of deciding upon. And the CEO of this company, Milford, is undecided and said, listen, you guys have the conversation and decide amongst yourselves which ones we're going to fund. We know that we can't fund all three. So you see there are three uh, men who have been there for over 20 years. Craig and I are kind of the newbies and I'm the only woman in this team. Part of what we know is that the Chromium project is going to be expensive in the sense that it's going to cost 30% of cash flow for three years. In the fourth year, it's going to start to get a return and it'll get a 20% return for 10 years. What we've got here is we have a diagram which you guys can manipulate. So you'll see there's a line, for example, between Owen and Al. So we know something from the cards about that relationship. Is that a positive relationship of trust or a negative tr relationship? You'll see that the CEO is in the middle with red lines going out from him. Who does the CEO trust most? second most, third most, fourth, and then least. Now you'll notice that there's two blue lines missing between Owen and Tom and Owen and Craig. That's because Joel has not given us that information. This is a slide that I've kind of put in to help you out. It gives you a grid in which you can do quantitative analysis. And I'm going to ask you what strategic influencing moves should happen between the Monday and the Friday. Akash is going to be sending um, to you information. And this is basically for you to be able to participate in the group. And then we want you to come together as soon as possible and begin to share what you know, so that you can begin to think through what strategic influencing should happen. Uh, Rajiv, Vishesh, Liz, and I, we are all a team. We have uh, the case cards, the, the ones that Akash has sent us, and there is uh, one case card each against our name. So the first step is that we are all digesting the information that is there on the case card that's against our name. Alongside all of us together had to chew the information that's on all the four case cards, share the information with each other. We need to digest the information uh, on the case cards uh, that, is, that is there to fill in this template first, talking about uh, the highest uh, trust um, relationship with the CEO uh, from one to five, and then positive or negative relationships for which we have the minuses and the pluses to pick from, where we need to think through uh, what is the sequence, the first three steps that uh, should be taken to uh, as to who would speak to whom and in what order and what would they talk about. Now, what we, what we could do, an invitation that we can all take time to go through the case cuts that's against our name and uh, then come back together and share the information that all of us have as a group. Now is that all four of us have some piece of information that we've read and uh, we have this grid to fill, uh, you know, uh, together as a group. So one way is to go through uh, the case cards that we have uh, against our name and share what is that information. And now that we have uh, we've read our case cards, we can also share information about uh, that's there on our case card with the other person. And we also have access to the case cards of other people in case we need some references. Mm -hmm. So uh, Rajiv, we start from you and Vishesh and uh, Liz and I can join. I'll, I'll kind of... Uh give an overview of what exactly uh, is in my card. The CEO actually is, is got a good relationship with uh, Owen uh, and uh, he values his opinion highest. That's the first All thing. Right. So uh, Owen okay. is actually a, is the person who, uh, who needs to be influenced quite a bit because uh, any but on the personal level, he, he wants money to educate his children. He wants to become the CEO. And uh, he sees very marginal benefit in this project uh, of the Chrome project. And 
he also feels that combined uh, projects, all three of them, would be very detrimental for the first two years at least. And uh, CEO and Owen agree that they want at least 40% cash flow uh, coming in. And uh, another important point is that uh, Owen and Alice are, are not really on a good wicket. And Owen does not trust Alice at all for her judgment and sees okay. her threat to moving into the CEO slot. As far as Owen's opinion about Bill Stanton is concerned, he feels that Bill is quite reckless in, uh, in his judgment. And so that's a negative relationship uh, with Bill. Should, yeah. should we take a minute here to fill in the information that you've already shared with us? Some things were pretty clear that CEO trusts Owen the most. So Akash, if we could move one or two between CEO and Owen. Vishesh, do you agree? Yeah. Okay, and then uh, we also know that Owen and Alice, uh, Rajiv, correct me if I'm wrong, Owen and Alice, we saw a negative relationship, am I right? Yes. So, Akash, yes, if you can put a... Owen and Bill, right? No, uh, CEO yes. to our, uh, Owen, one, and then Owen to Alice, no, negative relationship. Rajiv, and I, I, I heard you also had the information where you said that Owen and Bill, uh, Owen doesn't trust Bill, right? Yeah, he doesn't value his judgment at all, so uh, it would be the wrong way to approach Owen through Bill. Right, so should we put a negative between Owen yeah. and Bill? Yes. Great. Does that cover all your cards? No, a bit more is, is that the CEO agrees with Owen that Milford's cash flow must not drop below 40%. And uh, point number eight says if he and Tom agree, I believe that means uh, if CEO and Tom agree or Owen and Tom agree, I can't make out from point Owen. number Okay, if Owen and Tom agree, Owen knows for certain that their opinion will determine a decision. So uh, Tom is a, is a key player in this to influence the decision, I believe. Owen also feels that when combined with other proposals, the Chromium project represents an unacceptable cash flow drain over the next two years. And uh, if that's the main thing, basically, uh, I think we need to get Tom. Tom actually uh, is, is a key to influencing Owen, as I can see. So, Yashesh, how about yeah. you? Can you share with us the cards that you have uh, so that we yeah. can continue um, building our knowledge together? Uh, I think my card is all about Tom. So that will give you the insight on uh, his view findings and Tom. Talking about Tom, Tom has a very conservative approach. He found uh, investing in new technology very risky. That's the background coming from. And he's uh, aware that he's in the most close to the CEO after Owen. Second, uh, talking about uh, his presence, is looking at a healthy exit from the company in about five years. We think about his career and presence out there. Talking about uh, his interest and beliefs in cash flow, he is the most interested in the Toledo plant project. So there, because him being conservative, as I mentioned earlier, the cash flow is the least being 12% annually for three years. And nothing mentioned about Chromium though, but for the Tensile project, the cash flow being 20% annually for over three years, that's another point of risk which uh, he finds. The reason why he is most uh, up and sure about the Toledo plan. With regards to his relations with uh, his peers, he is definitely, I think, not in very much uh, agreement to Alice finding that you know she has her own career path and her own uh, thinking and he doesn't believe in Alice's way of working as compared to Craig he has deep trust and respect for him and his working great so because we got some really important quantitative information from both of you for example I heard <clears throat> Vishesh you say that the tensile strength project is going to cost 20 percent of cash flow year yeah. on year right Yes. And um, I also heard you say Owen and the CEO are expecting 14%. They want the, the, the Chromium project to be over 14% per year, but they don't think it's going to be. Is that, did I, did I remember that correctly or am I making that up? Yeah. Yeah, he, they're firstly against the, uh, you know, combining all the projects together because it will lead to a negative uh, cash flow. Okay. The first okay. two years, but... Uh, and they want 40% cash flow coming in, in any case. Okay, so I think on the bottom of that slide, it says something like Owen and the CEO in green. They have that kind of lime green on the bottom. And basically, they together um, don't want to spend uh, more than 40% of cash flow any given year. 
So it yeah. means that, for example, given what we know about Chromium, which is a 30% cash flow spend and tensile strength, which is a 20%, you couldn't do both of those together because they're 50% together. So we need to learn more about the Toledo project to see what's possible with that. Now I want to have a conversation with you guys about you know, if we look at that, that, that um, you know, if we think about that, who should talk to whom in what order to do strategic influencing, um, Vishesh and Raji, what, what are your kind of first thoughts about that? Sorry, could you repeat your question? Yes, yeah, so if we look, you know, at the, the third of the, of the kind of slides um, is one where it's kind of like, who should talk to whom in what order about what and why. Let's think about step one. What do we think the first strategic influencing step will be? We're going to go back to Alice and we're going to advise her. So she's going to have to influence somebody to start the process. Who should, she in, who should she influence first? And then what should happen second and third? Well, let's think about the first one first. I think she should be influencing Owen first because Owen would be the most, uh, the closest one to the CEO to have any approvals possibly. I, I think that uh, approaching Owen, uh, because they, don't, they have a negative relationship. So you're going to meet, meet with a very, very fixed wall there. And there's no point in doing that especially for Alice. I think that uh, you need to firstly uh, win over uh, Tom and Craig, both these are priority because Tom does have a positive influence on the CEO. So, you know, the uh, oven seems to be the person who should be tackled last, but he has to be tackled, but we should gather our forces, you know, which, he, which we can muster by getting more people on our side Craig is an easy, easy win with him sitting on the fence. And perhaps, you know, getting getting Tom onto a side may, may be more helpful. Uh, if I would be Alice, I would talk to um, Bill first because I have a positive relationship with Bill. You know, I'm just visualizing if I go talk to Owen and we don't have a relationship that's based on trust, how would I be received when I talk to Owen about something that I am wishing for and I am wanting? Possibly. I, I was of the opinion that Alice could speak to Owen first because in this whole mix of whom trusting whom, somewhere the eye would have to be broken and it would be if Alice would do it to Owen. Because his opinion being of the most value to the CEO, the reason why. So I, I, I completely get what you're you're reacting to, which is the fact that Owen is the guy who's got the best relationship with the CEO. He's the most powerful and influential with the CEO of all five of the direct reports. So I can see the attraction of that. But I think um, if we think about what Rajiv and Sanchi have said, which is that relationship with between Owen and Alice is not a good one. In yeah. fact, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna amplify something that Rajiv said which is that Owen actually thinks that Alice is the, is the primary competitor to his getting the job as CEO. And he's desperate to get that job as CEO in two years because he's got six children in American universities, which cost like $50,000 per person each year. Um, so it's like $300,000 a year of outgoings that he's got just to, to support his kids at university. And he's also supporting two, um, two sisters. So, so he, he desperately needs the money and therefore he has to have that CEO job. And he doesn't trust her and he thinks she's the primary competitor. So imagine, imagine that, that conversation of her trying to influence him about, uh, about this plan. How do you yeah. think that would go? That would be a little tricky. I think I'll just try and go to some other cards as well to get a bit more insight on a particular relationship which you're mentioning. Yeah. So that's basically what we heard from, from Rajiv who, who mm -hmm. had the cards yeah. primarily about Owen, yeah? yeah. So I, I think it's a really high risk strategy. And that's one of the things that we should be considering is that the this, those who are really good at strategic influencing choose low risk conversations and that to me looks like a massively high risk conversation because they don't trust, he doesn't trust her. Right. And he thinks she's the primary competitor for a job right. that he is desperate to get. So where, where is their trust? And I think Sanchi, you kind of brought this out. Who, who does trust her? Bill. 
Bill. So that's a pretty easy conversation then with Bill. Uh, yeah. I mean, let's 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 talk about that. What what do you think should be happening in that conversation? And Rajiv, I'm going to ask you this: what what should Alice say to Bill in that conversation? I, I don't have the details, but uh, but primarily she should say, you see, the idea of getting Bill on the team is to see, you know, whenever you approach somebody, you got to look at what are their interests and show them that how how the project would also benefit them in this uh, whole game and uh, capitalize on the good relationship that you have so alice has a good relationship with bill they worked earlier and she should she should emphasize on what benefits that would be for bill too in this whole uh, thing because ultimately to each person that you talk to everybody is interested what's in it for me so I think that's what uh, Alice should do to build and project what, what benefit he will carry out of the whole game. So the primary thing that he's interested in is showing off how great his team is. He was planning to do that with the Tensile Strength Project, but if Alice actually says to him, listen, we're going to insource the tech for Chromium, then he has a different project, but he can still show off how great his team is. So she's going to have to offer him that the way in which you get the alignment between what she wants and what he wants. But he's going to have to give up tensile strength. And so part of what I think she can say to him is, listen, but if you put it off for three years, it's not going to have a negative impact on the, com on the company. And in three years, we're going to start getting a 20% return in the fourth year from Chromium, which will actually pay for tensile. Our project can fund your project in the fourth year. She's also going to need for him to ask to speak to somebody, um, I think, as well. Yeah, following suit, uh, Alice being talking to Bill. Uh, Bill has a great relation with Craig. I think that could be the second move uh, up there because uh, Tom has a healthy relation with Craig, whereas Tom doesn't believe in Alice. Okay. So the right way to you know get through Tom would be for Alice and Bill to next uh, get in line with. Oh, Craig. Yeah, I think that uh, that's perfectly all right. Uh, if Bill can influence Craig, uh, it seems all right to get him on the because he's sitting on the fence. Basically, you know, to pick up on what he was talking about before, which is this idea of having to get alignment, like what is Craig going to get out of this? Craig is driven by doing the right thing long term for the organization. And we know that Chromium is going to do that. So in that regard, you know, Craig puts a tick in the box. And if we follow this, the relationship between Craig and Bill is strong. So it's a low risk conversation. Now, Craig also has this information about, um, you know, the 12% for Toledo going down to 6% because it's a legal change, right, Sanchi? So he has critical information right. for the whole, the whole piece, really. And I think Bill has to sort of alert him to the fact that this is why we can do Toledo as well as Chromium because the cost is going to be 50% of what we thought it was going to be. And so we can do two projects, 30% plus 6%, and still be below that level of the 40% cap that the CEO and Owen have put in place. Sanchi, you have the cards for Craig. So what's your perspective on all this? Uh, yeah, I feel uh, for the reason that Rajiv was suggesting that Craig should be number two for sure. And uh, I, two things that I agree, actually, one thing that uh, that Shajib said, one was that, you know, he is actually uh, sitting on the fence kind of. So, you know, it's it, it's it's a good idea to probably go to him second uh, through Bill. So that's one thing that I agree with. And uh, then, of course, uh, about working at Toledo plus Chromium uh, for, you know, the tax and legal case uh, reduction that uh, is going to happen through that. So I think I agree with both these two points. And I'm just going through my uh, case card again in case I missed any information. Mm. Uh, it, it looks like um, Rajiv is reconnecting. He had some technical issues. So, I mean, I feel comfortable because he has taken the course before um, that we can kind of move on. But I, I, I want to ask a question to Sanchi, you and Vishesh. What do you think about the idea of Alice going with Bill to have the meeting with Craig? What do you think about that idea? Mm -hmm. I think uh, that may not be the right choice. 
I think here the relation between Craig and Alice uh, wasn't stated, if I'm not wrong. It was stated. Basically, yes. he had a bad first meeting with her. Mm -hmm. And then Tom started to kind of whisper in his ear, I don't trust yeah. her motives, you know, so he doesn't have a good impression of her. Yeah, I think it would backstab in case uh, Alice accompanies Bill. So Bill could do this on his own. Okay, so it would be like a backfiring if yes. if she went along. Sanchi, what do you think? I was thinking it uh, about it like one is, of course, uh, the point that uh, Vishay suggested. And the second piece that I was thinking was that uh, uh, imagine a room where uh, there are two people walking into a room where probably say I am sitting and uh, they walk into my room. And my instinct would be that, you know, they are trying to kind of, uh, you know, put me, uh, you know, in a corner and kind of attack. So some some sort of, you know, fear and anxiety and uh, insecurity would emerge in me if there are two people uh, coming into my room and talking to me where I kind of, I'm, I'm assuming that they have kind of paired up already to talk to me about something that they mm -hmm. are on a team on already. So right. I, I would feel really insecure about that, uh, you know, meeting, taking on that meeting. So yeah, I, I might uh, act very uh, insecure and defensive even if I could change my opinion, I would be very defensive and it might not go well if there are two people walking into my room. So it's it puts risk. It sounds like it puts a lot of risk into the situation. And part of what we're trying to do is find paths with low risk. So if we kind of think about um, Vishesh's suggestion, which is Bill goes to Craig on his own versus the option I threw in there of Alice and Bill go together, it sounds like Vishesh's option is better. It's lower risk. Okay, so let's let's assume that then that that is going to be our second our second choice, and then <clears throat> what would what would you suggest, Vishesh, that our third option would be of the third this third strategic influencing move? What would make most sense? Yeah, I think Greg going to Tom would make sense. That is one possibility which I see. Yeah, Greg going to Tom would be of I think this uh, stronger opinion I would have. Craig to Tom, and what what would you suggest would be in that conversation? Like, what would what would Craig say to Tom? So Tom, uh, I think Tom being in the card which I had, Tom uh, stated to have great trust and respect for Craig. So having stated that, uh, I think whatever Craig uh, would put up to influence him, it would at least be for Tom to more believing in. Also, because he has an opinion and being more keen on the Toledo plant. And here, you know, where you're talking the tornado and conium, which you know could be paired up with, will help uh, conium storm to join team. Okay, so part of what I'm hearing you say is that they have a strong relationship, and so it's low risk conversation. Right. Um, but also, he was saying Tom is interested in Toledo, and he's going to get Toledo. So we can tell him, Craig can tell him that in the conversation. Yeah, as long as you you are able to uh, kind of accommodate the other person's interest into the whole game and not uh, uh, show that you do it, show disregard for his ideas, I think it should be easy to win over and looking at uh, the uh, overall interest because I think Tom also I think he believes that Alice is doing something for the company and uh, good for the company. And uh, if that, that feeling is there, that should be exploited. You got to put uh, both personal interests and the company interests both into your arguments. Absolutely, absolutely. So <clears throat> um, are, would you be comfortable with this as a third move, Rajiv? Craig goes to Tom and has that conversation with him? Yes, I mean, um, only, only rival is that when do we approach Avan? That's the whole game. Plan the final game as the wicket has to fall there. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. So uh, whoever uh, has a, a pro good approach to Avan and he should not be taken by surprise. That's important, and he should. There should be some kind of warming up to the idea uh, being done for Avan. So that has to be kept in mind on how to do it. Okay. And Sanchi, what's your perspective on the Craig to Tom? as number three in the conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel that that should be the next for sure. But also uh, like Rajiv suggested that uh, 
what cra uh, what does CRA really stands for that should be included into the conversation? Absolutely. So I think, you know, if we if Akash, you could put that in as as step three, that makes sense to me. And to kind of pick up Rajiv on what you had been talking about there, your point is in the first three steps, we're not actually talking to Owen, who's the most powerful guy in relation to the CEO. So if we have these three as our steps one, two and three, there has to be a fourth step, right, which is somebody's going to have to go and have a conversation with Owen before the Friday when we meet together. So who do you think that should be? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point this at Rajesh and, and Vishesh. What do you think um, should be the fourth? You know, who goes to Owen? Uh, both Alice and Bill, uh, I've got a negative relationship with uh, Owen. And I think that uh, in terms of uh, impartiality, um, Craig, Craig, could somehow influence Owen because he is giving a legal perspective, and also he he uh, he is taken as a somehow neutral in organizational politics. Uh, the legal person is not taken as a contender in any way. He is just offering advice. So you, it would be safe to you know do let the Craig do the warming up and then Tom uh, also influence Owen next. So Vishesh, what do you think of yeah. that plan? Yeah, I would be of a similar opinion. Also, Tom being on the verge of his retirement, so uh, it wouldn't be a threat to Owen as he's uh, doubting to be the next CEO. So, so that's, I think that's a really important point to consider. Um, Sanchi, what do you think? I'm a little confused about, you know, who should go, Tom or Craig. I was just going through my Craig notes, if I can find a cue to move in one direction. I am not sure yet. Okay, so Akash, can I ask you to move back to our little star shape? Because part of what I said to you guys at the beginning was that Joel has told us information and wherever he's told us information about the relationships, we have a line between the two. But you'll see in this, Vishesh and Rajiv, if you're there, there is no line between Owen and Tom or Owen and Craig, which means Joel did not tell us what their relationships are like. So Rajiv has pointed out that it can't be Alice and it can't be Bill because we know for sure they have negative relationships with Owen. So we really don't want to put them in those conversations. And it means it's going to be one of the other two, but we have to find out which one has a better relationship with him before we decide that. Joel is a bit tricky in what he, he's very careful about what he tells you and what he doesn't tell you. So absolutely, somebody's got to go to Owen before the Friday, before the meeting. And it's going to be either Tom or Craig, but we don't know which one until we find out who, who has a higher trust relationship with him. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. So I think we can, um, we can come into, you know, kind of like close this out and now pretend that we're talking it through um, with the boss. Um, Sanchi, I would love for you to do any final debriefs that have not been done as we've been going along. Mm, I would just say, I think in a nutshell, um, that what we tried to do was to cover the low risk, high trust relationships first. So that's something that I'd like to say. Second, we tried to see something what Rajiv suggested that uh, we took uh, in terms of thinking about what should be talked about, we took into account what are the uh, individual uh, benefits or individual concerns and interests at the same time, the business's interests. So we looked at both in a way uh, and all of that in an ethical way, I feel. Uh, so that's second. Third thing that we uh, also looked at is that how uh, two to one, uh, a two people conversation with one person is a risky conversation as compared to a one-to-one -one conversation. So I would also like to highlight that. And uh, third thing that I'd like to highlight, um, I don't know who had that, but there was some information that was a little, uh, you know, could have been used slyly. Uh, Liz, did you have that card? I don't know. Somebody spoke I about did. this. In, you did. Yeah. And can you can you read that information for us? Just that reading that sentence for all of us to know what that was. I, I don't have the cards in front of me. So this is from memory, but basically. All right. Bill knows that Alice has information about Tom 
And if she misrepresented the information, she could get Tom pushed into an unwanted early retirement. So Tom is not aware of this, but Bill is aware of this and Alice is aware of this, but she would basically have to do something unethical to push him out. And if you will, you know, take away somebody who she's afraid will not support chromium. Right. Thanks. Thanks. So we did have that, in, in that information and in uh, life circumstances, such information always exist about people. But here is a case where we did not use that information at all. And still we were able to at least get through the first three strategic steps of, uh, you know, uh, the task that's in front of us. So that's another, uh, you know, a recap that I had that uh, information like this always exists, but we need not use them and we can be absolutely ethical uh, in making our strategic moves to a certain decision that will support us and the organization together. Last bit I think I'd like to mention is that in a nutshell again, that in this whole uh, strategic influencing, it was never that we were uh, not abiding or doing th something that's useful for the company. There was nothing that was against the interest of the company or would have affected the company in a bad way. So also bringing that to our attention. So uh, that's, that's from me, Liz. And okay. please share if I missed anything. Thank you. Um, Akash, could you get, move us on to the next slide, please? So, and we can kind of get the bullet points. These come in, I think, one at a time. So Alice knew that she had to get active in the process of influencing. She couldn't just kick back and do a really good presentation on the Friday. So a question to Vishesh and Rajiv, um, could you have come to this strategy with only the quantitative information? No, no way. Uh, I, because you see, uh, uh, decisions made of this nature are not based on uh, absolute rationality. And you need rationality to kind of uh, support your arguments. And, but you need to look at the human aspect, the emotion aspect, and the motivation aspect of people also uh, to actually formulate a strategy. So that's what we are actually learning here is beyond, beyond rational, what more to look at human dynamics in organizations to achieve what you want. Fantastic. So Vishesh, let me ask you the opposite question. Could you have come to this strategy of Alice to Bill, Bill to Craig, Craig to Tom with only the qualitative information and none of the quantitative information? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. Because qualitative would have just got uh, us to know about uh, uh, you know, what, is, what kind of relation exists between the two without having uh, the risks involved in it. I think the quantity helps us know the risks involved in the said relationships, and it takes helps us take the right route via you know home to home. So, absolutely. Yeah. So the point is to get a really thorough strategic um, plan. You need both qualitative and quantitative, and in this case, we've given you forty five pieces of information together that give you all that you need. In real life, you're going to have to find all the qualitative and, and quantitative information that you actually need to make a good strategy. Okay, next bullet point, Akash. Um, and this has really been covered by Sanchi. Um, I told you about that kind of dirt card that Joel has put into the deck, but we didn't use it. We didn't discuss it. None of us went there. Um, so everything that you did in the Alice to Bill, Bill to Craig, Craig to Tom is ethical. So you do need to have a good level of interpersonal skills to be able to strategically influence somebody. But part of what the research has shown is that most mid-managers have that skill base. If you have somebody with really low emotional intelligence, maybe somebody who's on the spectrum and does not have the ability to be um, you know, friendly in the way that they actually influence. So how important is the strategy, Rajiv, of Alice to Bill, Bill to Craig, Craig to Tom? Yeah, it's definitely uh, <clears throat> uh, very important uh, to follow the path of influencing. You have to see which, which person in the, in the chart has more influence on the other, and then approach that person to break down the walls of resistance. Uh, it's very important to see who, which, which, which weapon would be the most suitable to break the armor 
to get into the other person's mind and uh, move him in the direction that you want. That, that, that way, it's a very critical part of the analysis that you have to do in moving people. Uh, one thing which kind of um, uh, I'm still a little uh, wanted to ask you is about this last piece of conversation about Alice knowing something about Tom that, that could have derailed his career. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma whether to use that arm to sting technique uh, or not. Sometimes uh, one argument could be that for if the end goal is good, uh, there's no harm in using some arm to sting. But um, on the other hand, if you have to be absolutely ethical about it, uh, then you have to drop that idea. I wanted more, more, more views and discussion on this issue, if you can. So I'll give you a little bit more. Um, basically, the, the key factor here is that Alice would have to misrepresent what she knows to actually push him out. So the actual truth is quite neutral, but is she'd have to present it as something that it wasn't really to try to make him look unethical and force okay. him out of the company. What I'm saying is that if, if the truth was true, I mean, if the illegality of Tom's actions were true, then in that case, what should have been Alice's reaction? In case, think, it, in case she didn't have to misrepresent, but only kind of squeal about it. So it would have been it would have been another another consideration in this process. But what's interesting here, I think, Rajiv, <clears throat> not to go too far down that path, but to just sort of respond to you is that when you take a decision like that to, if you will, out somebody who's done something unethical, it depends what it is, of course, um, it, or, or illegal. It depends what it is, but it has, it has a big impact on the messenger and the, and the career of the messenger, usually. So that's another aspect to take into consideration. You know, whistleblowers usually can't stay in the companies where they've blown the whistle even if what they're doing is morally correct. But I have to say that is really a whole other course on business ethics, which we don't have time for today, I'm afraid. Yeah, I know it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult uh, thing because it, it defeats the whole concept of whistleblowing uh, when we say that. It, it is true that whistleblowers don't, don't get, you know, they don't realize any benefits of doing whistleblowing, but uh, exactly. then, then that check and balance is lost out if that you don't allow that. Exactly. Okay, so um, I'm gonna just make one point about this, the importance of strategy. If you had not done Alice to Bill, Bill to Craig, Craig to Tom, and you went instead to what is the knee jerk reaction of Alice goes to Owen, Owen's gonna have a bad reaction. He's gonna probably go to the CEO immediately and say, listen, I didn't trust this woman before, but listen to, what she's saying now. She's telling me she doesn't want the CEO job. That's totally unbelievable. Uh, get rid of her. Forget about Chromium. Whatever you did after that, it doesn't matter because he's already gone to the top and destroyed your chances. So following that line of strategy is really crucial. Part of what Joel found was that almost everybody has the basic skills of strategic influencing. But what he found was that almost nobody uses them. So now we're going to look at Joel's actual research. And he was looking at what stops people from engaging in strategic influencing, especially if part of what he found was not that many people do use the skills. So he was very curious about why wouldn't they use these skills? Because clearly they help your career. Why, why not use them? This is directly from Joel's research. And what he found was that 65 to 80% of people know how to do this, but don't do it. He called them the idealists. And his, um, his research showed that they have lower impact on the organizations. And as a result, their careers move slower. The people who are engaged in it are on the right-hand side, 20% approximately of every organization that he worked with. He called these people the pragmatists. Um, and as you can see, there's a kind of red bubble and a green bubble. And the red is 15% in what he called mocks um, or Machiavellians, and only a 5% the savvy. And essentially these two, the red correlates to the fox, 
And the green savvy correlates to the wise owl. He was an Italian um, living at the time when Italy was um, lots of warring states. He was basically a kind of consultant of the day who was essentially saying to senior people, I can help you retain the power and control that you have and increase it. And here's how I would do it. So he wrote a letter to one of the ruling families of the day in Italy, which has subsequently been, been turned into a book called The Prince. So that's where you got the prince from, because he was trying to convince this prince to hire him as a consultant to help actually uh, extend the power and influence of, uh, of, of this prince. So um, he's, he's famous for being amoral, which means that he's not really taking morality into consideration. He's not moral. He's not unmoral. He's basically not thinking about that part of it all and kind of advising. So he's, um, he's got a negative connotation around him as a result, Vishesh. And he is equivalent to really to the fox. He was basically how, this is how Joel referred to the foxes as mocks. Um, and you'll see that 5% wise owls or the savvy, as Joel called them, 5% of the organizations, it's a tiny portion. And so this is where we go back to the kind of Badley and James model in our heads and think this is the population because they have a higher impact on their organizations. These are the ones who become the leaders of most organizations. And there is that three to one ratio of Machiavellian or fox-like versus the savvy owls. So you have in leadership roles on average, about three quarters of them, 75% of them are the foxes and only about 25% are the owls. So this is a really interesting thing to think about because it means the owls have to understand the foxes because they're surrounded by them. They have to work with those people. They're often in peer roles, sometimes in boss roles. Okay, can we have the next slide please? So what Joel found in his research was that there were two things that actually stopped people from moving from the left to the right. In other words, becoming active in strategic influencing. The first um, that I'm going to talk about is the moral block. So it's the kind of idea that you look over that brick wall and what do you see? Mostly foxes, Machiavellians. And you think to yourself, I have a strong moral compass. I'm an ethical person and I don't want to compromise that. So I only see people doing this. It's very easy to not see the 5%, to not realize that you can do it in an ethical way. And so they don't wanna come anywhere near it, which is why I get pushed back on people who actually have been forced to take this course. The second of the two is um, the rational block. And Joel himself was a scientist by nature and by training. Um, and, and he had this himself the kind of idea that I shouldn't have to engage in strategic influencing. The quality of my work is really good and it should speak for itself. So, you know, let me just ask the group, any of you kind of identify with that, the rational block Sanchi does? Let's think about that one. What is, what, what's the meaning of that? What, is, what does that actually mean? So it, it, let's think about a rational world. If this is, if you have a normal hierarchy in, um, you know, a normal kind of large company, you'll have the CEO at the top of that organization, and then maybe a managing director, direct reports, um, or multiple, sometimes they have um, four or five or six direct reports, and then you have people kind of going down in through the organization. So in, let me ask you the question, who has the most influence in a rational company? Who would have the most influence on the CEO's opinion? DMD. The MD, and, and why, why would you suggest that? I think that uh, the chain of command becomes primary here, and uh, nothing can move up the chain uh, without uh, passing through the MD. So okay. our power will get concentrated into the top here and then use it to influence the CEO. So in a rational world, the people who are direct reports you would expect them to have the most influence on the CEO. But if we now think about this in a different way and we start to think about a, a, you know, one of the companies that is, let's say one of the big family owned Indian companies where you have, let's say relatives, if you're the CEO and you're a part of that ruling family, you have relatives in all parts of the organization. So think about what, whichever company you want to, where there are, are relatives, there are friends of yours that are in the company, okay? And now you start to think, would those people have an influence on the CEO? 
And if so, how, when? I think it, it also takes into consideration the scope of the decision to be made primarily. If it is a, a company-wide decision, uh, then no single person would influence uh, you know, in an individual way. But if there are sections of operations where one relative or one, one person uh, deals with that and uh, he exercises influence in his area of operations, then he would bypass the chain and uh, get the CEO to agree to what he wants to do. It also depends on the level of decentralization that exists uh, within the company. So I'm going, to, I'm going to push back a little bit on that, Rajiv, by saying, you know, hey, let's imagine the lives of these family members. They're meeting the CEO at um, maybe when they go to religious festivals. They might be meeting at birthdays or um, other family events. Um, they're meeting quite regularly, maybe multiple times a month in informal settings where they can take the CEO aside and say, hey, um, you know, there's a problem in my part of the business and my boss is doing this and have you heard that so-and-so is actually doing some unethical things? They take the CEO aside in these private settings, in these settings which for them are you know, a normal part of their lives and actually have a quiet word. Equally in a place like the UK and sometimes in India as well, um, you, know, you may have gone to boarding school with the CEO and you have very close friendships that have become almost like fam family type relationships during your teens. Um, you know, Rajiv, I know you have a military background. People from military heritage are often very close because they've lived in situations where they have to rely upon each other for their lives to be saved. So these bonds are very tight. And maybe those, maybe those um, kind of brothers in arms or um, close friends meet on a regular basis, even if it's once a month for a golfing day or something like that, where they have a whole day of informal time to actually influence the CEO on things. So these are kind of human chains of trust, which are basically non-rational, if you will, but actually have massive implications on how the CEO is thinking about individuals and possibly even ideas. Um, so so this, is, this is an important thing to consider is where are the human bonds of trust? What are those lines of trust? How do they map into the situation that you're in? Now, does, let me so, stop there and say, if you, do you guys have any questions or pushback on that? What you're saying is absolutely correct. And that's the reality that uh, beyond, beyond the structure, there is a there's a different mapping of trust levels and uh, uh, in fact i think that when you talk of the old school bonding and other things it puts a ceo or a decision maker into much more of a dilemma where a favor is asked for which may not be actually good for the organization and but yet he has to kind of keep up with that bond so um, it puts ethical dilemma in, in the decision makers, uh, you know. Indeed, indeed. And, you know, this can happen at all sorts of levels. I mean, I actually was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago who is um, working very closely with the prime minister of this country, Boris Johnson, and where there have been rumors for many months that Boris Johnson's wife, Carrie, has a lot of influence over his decision-making. Now she's not an elected official. She's not even hired to do that job, but that's the reality on the ground in you know, modern day London. So she's not on the org chart, let's put it that way, right? Yeah. And yet her opinions have carry very heavy weight. So it's, you know, she has a chance to have one-to-one -one informal high trust conversations with the prime minister. Okay, so let's let's move forward, Akash. Um, so the course today is trying to unblock, you know, take those barriers away and free you up to um, start engaging more in strategic influencing. And of course, we are teaching that green, savvy, owl path. Um, but it's always up to you to choose. But that's how we're that's the one we're choosing to to teach. Let's go forward from here. Um, and forward again. So part of what Joel dis discerned was um, that those who are savvy are ethical, well-liked, and continuously able to make an impact, but they weren't different in, his, in the kind of psychometrics that he gave people in 1974. 
in terms of personality, intelligence, or in terms of their interpersonal skills. The big, big difference between the savvy and the others was that they had three times the networks. Now, if you think about this, if you have really strong networks, you can get all the data that you need to create a really good strategy quickly. So you can call up a friend and say, hey, does Sanchi actually trust Vishesh? You can call up, you can write to another friend and say, what does Rajiv actually care about? And you can get all the data that you actually need quickly if you've got a big network and a strong network. So that's a really interesting thing to think about because it's a kind of critical aspect of success. And they, the final point there is that they consistently took small risks. So yes, of course you have to take a risk. If Alice goes to Bill and says, um, will you please give up tensile strength project? He could say no. So there's a risk of him saying no, but what they're trying to do all the time is reduce the risk. And they reduce the risk by having A, strong trust relationships, B, think carefully about what is this person going to get out of aligning with me? What are the benefits to that individual? And get that alignment with the individual as well. So those are critical aspects of uh, reducing risk. But as a result, these people enjoy um, three times the odds of a successful innovation attempt. And that was a really big thing for Joel because he was an innovator. Significantly higher performance ratings, two times the promotion rates and three times the bonus rates, three times more likely to have higher job and life satisfaction and more likely to be viewed as leaders. So the benefits of strategic influencing in an ethical way are very significant. Next slide, please. And we're gonna move forward through this. Joel's definition of political savvy was ethically building a critical mass of support for an idea you care about. So some people ask me, do I have to do this for every single thing, Liz? No, but if there's an idea you really care about, then you, it's gonna behoove you to do the strategic planning and then do the strategic influencing to be able to boost your chances of success to get what it, what it is that you're trying to, to do. Okay, now we're gonna have a little quiz and I'm gonna actually take myself out of the equation so that it's um, Vishesh, Rajiv, um, Sanchi. We're going to have four savvy strategies. We're gonna look at each one separately, individually and finish one before we move on to the next. And basically there's a question and then four potential answers. And Sanchi, I'm gonna ask you to read through the questions and the potential answers out loud. And then I want you as a group to discuss which one you think the savvy would choose as the answer. And I'm gonna just give you a little warning before we move to the next slide, which is Joel liked to add what he called danger words. These are words in the question or the answer that increase risk. So be on the lookout for this. Savvy strategy one. So Sanchi, over to you. So the first savvy strategy is as follows, and we have to choose a option, and we could choose multiple if we can't find one. Let's see. So I think possibly it would be B. I would choose Delta D. Primarily, you're interested in you know discussing with people who will influence the decision. That the word hmm. influence is critical here. Hmm. We, we are talking of influencing the decision. Um, uh, before I kind of sort of give you the, the politically savvy answer, what I want to do is to ask you to look at the question itself, because there is a danger word, one that increases risk um, in the question itself. What is that word? Yeah. Building support. New, a new I idea. New, new, new idea. Yeah, a new idea is harder to get support for than one that's been kicking around for a while or right. is incremental, yeah. yeah? So it, it's a bit risky, this situation. Um, but then as we looked in kind of A, B, C, and D, and you've kind of said no to A, B, and C. So let's look at those. Um, Sanchi, you had sort of talked about, and there's two things that I want you to keep in your minds here in terms of the debrief, two learnings, really. The first is, Who's the target population for your influencing? And the second is, how are you doing that influencing? Okay, so if we look at the target, A is completely untargeted, right? It's like a scattergun approach. You're just sort of randomly going out to people. So that's not what the savvy would do. The second one actually has some danger words in it. And I want you to put danger words and phrases and tell me what they are. So in this particular case, the word official 
is going to increase the risk for you. Yeah, it's going to make this a riskier situation. And the other thing that's going to be really risky is the key decision makers. If you go straight to the key decision makers and they like your idea, fantastic. If they don't like your idea, it's going to be very difficult to go back to them again. So it's a high risk binary thing to actually go directly to the key decision makers. So what we're getting in B is the way you do it, which is official, which is dangerous, and the target group, key decision makers, very dangerous to go to them directly. So let's look at the third C and talk to me, talk me through what's dangerous about this. There are two danger words in here. One is the target the group end. and one is the how. I think the end. superior is the same thing as B. In what way? And yeah, and then they are not decision makers, basically. We don't know if they are, um, but superiors, which is a target, a specific target group, are often a higher risk group than peers or direct reports. But the the the, the other thing is the how, right? So formally, I think is going to be higher risk than informal. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Also, maybe it's a different kind of approach with the. Uh, different people in the same organization over an idea. Is it also a risk? Um, not so much, uh, but it's more that you want to work informally with everybody, not formally. Right. And so the, political, the politically savvy have agreed completely with all three of you that they would choose D because it's informal in the way that you're doing it. And the group you're choosing is the influencers of the key decision makers. So these are people who are like not in the middle of the bullseye, but one layer out. They know a lot about the key decision makers and they can tell you stuff about what's motivating this one um, and so on. That's gonna inform the way that you influence those people. Um, and they're gonna be able to kind of give you clarity about he's not gonna react well to that slide because he's interested in this. And so it'll help you hone your approach when you get to the key decision makers. And they'll also be able to influence on your behalf. So they completely agree with you. Oh, that's great. So we're gonna, I'll walk through these. So Joel basically found from the people that he interviewed that they were systematic in the way that they, they walked through the strategy, but they were informal in the way that they did the influencing. So they, syst they made the strategy and then they walked through it systematically, but always influencing informally. They use that 51% guide. <clears throat> they did exactly what you talked about, Rajiv, of linking agendas. Um, what's the next one? Uh, they follow the path of credibility, which is another way of talking about, they follow the line of trust and they get people who trust each other to do the influencing. They definitely use interpersonal diplomacy, but they didn't have to be the level of you know, UN diplomats. Um, and all companies have group meetings to make these big decisions about strategy, budgets, and so on. But they do the influencing before they get to those groups. And finally, they use the plan act approach. So they make the plan and they finalize the plan before they actually take action. They don't just do it like off the cuff. You know, they bump into somebody that they know I have to influence in the hallway and then just say, oh, can I have five minutes, Sanchi? No, they do the strategy first and understand what's the order in which you do things because that's so critical to getting everything done successfully. Great, okay, so let's move on to the next slide. And so now we're gonna look at the mapping tools and then we're gonna pair up and do a little bit of work together in pairs using the tools. Alice went to Bill first, then Bill went to Craig second, and then Craig went to Tom third. And someone's gonna to have to go to Owen next, but we don't know which one until we find out who's got better trust with him, Tom or Craig. Okay, any questions about this before we do some paired work? Okay, and, and that really, with that, I'm gonna close and say thank you to DLC for giving us this opportunity. It's been really fun and um, fully engaged. And um, I, I feel like we're gonna be sending a couple of people into the world with much stronger skills and in strategic influencing in an ethical way. So thank you guys.